All right, so, hi. <laughs> My name is Jens and I, I started working here um, a year and a half ago or so uh, with, um, uh, with the electron microscopy division sort of of C CCI. But my expertise lies in, in uh, cryo-electron microscopy. And uh, in both of Rafa's and Arians, you, you basically had it from the point of view of CCI being sort of the big fish in the, in the, in the pond where the users are the small fish comes to us. In cryo-EM, it works a little bit uh, differently, especially in Sweden, and uh, it has to do with cost. The cryo-electron microscopy equipment is, is uh, fairly expensive. So in this case, we are the small fish that comes and visits uh, bigger fishes in Sweden. <laughs> but uh, before I get into that, just a little, um, you know, what is cryo-EM, uh, so that you all know what it is. It's a technique not everyone is familiar with, but basically it's a electron microscopy technique in which you uh, vitrify or freeze uh, your sample in whatever buffer so that it becomes vitreous ice instead of crystalline ice. Uh, and this preserves both the structure of your sample as well as uh, protects the sample from, from the vacuum of, of, um, of the electron microscopy column, not to mention the, the electrons that are, are bombarding it, of course. Uh, it's mostly used for, for two reasons, uh, either for structure biology or, or cell biology. Now something happened here. Nothing close. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so in structural biology, it's mostly used to, to get um, atomic or at least near atomic uh, resolution structures of, of proteins or protein complexes. And uh, this has been uh, been going up now for maybe uh, yeah, close, to a, close to a decade. This is, uh, has been feasible to do. Uh, in cell biology, it's mostly used for... for, for cryo, cryo like tomography. Uh, where it's used to look at uh, ultrastructures uh, of, of cells. And here you can see, actually, this one I took, I just searched this morning in, in the bioarchive if there was any cryo-electron tomography paper out, and this one <laughs> was, was out there. And here you can see they have, they have looked at, uh, at mitochondria in, in various uh, conditions. And uh, obviously, freezing uh, your sample and, or fixing it is always a debate which is best and which best preserves uh, ultrastructures. Uh, obviously, cryo-electron tomography allows you to, to reach a little bit higher resolution, if not uh, preserving your sample better. Uh, the workflow of uh, cryo-electron microscopy, I'll show you here the, the single particle analysis workflow. Basically, what we do is, um, is we take a, a small thin um, a grid of metal, usually copper, in which there is a perforated uh, carbon film on top. We add our sample to this and we blot away most of it using a filter paper before plunging it down into to liquid ethane, freezing whatever is in the buffer uh, inside of these uh, holes. This is a perpendicular view of one of these holes. Uh, you could very roughly divide the cryo-EM into two phases, the sample preparation and then the, the microscopy part. And the microscopy part is, of course, a little bit more in, um, uh, she was say interesting for us in this context of remote uh, control, uh, where we see um, uh, where we can use it basically to look at either single particle stuff that we do in in this image here. We have someone here who has looked at uh, yeah. artificial liposomes, and here we have someone who has looked at uh, uh, filaments of uh, of um, amyloid filaments. I think they are, and of course in both the, the first and the third one. Uh, people are looking for atomic resolution uh, structures of, of their proteins, whereas uh, the second one is more close to, to the, to the ultrastructure um, uh, things that you get in, in cryo-electron tomography. This particular user didn't do electron tomography. She just wanted to shape, check the, the, the shapes of, of, her, of her liposomes. And of course... Just close it. Close it, close it, close it. Just close it, just close yeah. it. <laughs> uh, the sample screening and the data collection part of this, the microscopy part, is the one that we can uh, do remotely. So this is the one I'm, I'm going to look uh, a little bit close to. Pond, uh, and this uh, sort of um, pond, I hope you can hear me, it says that the internet connection is unstable, uh, um, is called CryoScreenNet, and it's set up by, by these guys at, uh, at uh, SciLife Lab. So right now we are five universities uh, that are that are collaborating in this, and it's 
two of these are from national facilities, and then we have three collaborative uh, universities. And uh, the two facilities lies in uh, Stockholm and in Umeå, and they have the most expensive microscopes, whereas uh, Gothenburg, Uppsala, and Lund, uh, Uppsala has a quite good microscope. Uh, Lund are getting a microscope, but uh, in the meantime, uh, we, we have to rely on using the microscopes at uh, Umeå and Solna. Our own microscope is, is, is fine, it works, uh, but it's not um, as advanced as the ones in Stockholm and, and Umeå. Uh, and yeah, the reason why we do this, right, is because these are very expensive equipments and uh, we have sort of organized uh, cryovium then in Sweden more as akin to that of a, a beam line in, in classical crystallography, where you keep uh, the resources centralized and then you allow users to, to come to them. And uh, doing so, uh, this uh, obviously increases the, the, the turnover of, of these machines because it allows for multiple users to, to be booked per, per each session. And um, uh, for us, uh, as a fringe uh, part of this, we can uh, gather all our users in, in, in Gothenburg area and, and uh, do things together remotely, right? So for instance, shipping samples, we can co-ship samples uh, with, with each other and so on. Uh, one other thing I would say about uh, CryoEM in Sweden is that uh, all of these universities that you see here are under the same sort of system when it comes to, to, to the machines itself. So we're using uh, the Thermo Fisher, formerly FBI machines, which all share the same type of outer loader system so that they are all compatible in between each other. When we prepare a sample for, for, for the microscope in Lund, you can just ship that sample later on to Umeå or to Stockholm if you so should, or like we do, we prepare it in Gothenburg and then ship it and everything is compatible. Uh, when it comes to, to the remote capabilities here, all of these Thermo Fisher microscopes, they work on a, a Windows operative system, which obviously uh, helps uh, when it comes to, to this uh, digitalization of, of working with uh, electron microscopes. And this allows us to, to remote share screen and control the microscope. And this is something that has uh, been the case for this microscope for a long time. Uh, post uh, Pre-COVID uh, pandemic, this was used mainly by the Thermo Fisher technicians to, in order to perform some light maintenance and, and troubleshoot for, for users who have some problems. But since uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, more and more we get uh, um, access to these tools uh, as uh, operators as and in fact some of users as well in order to 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 remote control our, our microscopes um Erin mentioned a few computer programs uh, that uh, she uses uh we use something called uh, real VNC which uh, you can access with this VNC viewer tool uh unlike uh, the what did you call it? No, no machine. Uh, VNC viewer does allow you to 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 look at uh, multiple screens at the same time. So that's uh, one thing I didn't know was <laughs> a problem for no machine. So maybe this is something for you guys to to investigate if you want to do. Uh, and yes, yeah, so long uh, before this has been the the view of how we look in 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 the electron microscopy, but now this is how a workstation looks at, and we are in fact uh, digital access. Just like um, Aaron's case, we have a, a, a keypad, which can be a little bit troublesome because it contains these knobs, uh, these joysticks. Uh, another problem is, of course, uh, loading in the samples. Uh, to solve the first problem with the knobs and joysticks, we do have this old school uh, virtual pad, which in my opinion, uh, I have a love-hate relationship with. It works, but it's not uh, it's not the greatest tool ever. You can, of course, also uh, do a lot of uh, manipulation of, um, for instance, the stage inside of the graphical uh, interface of, of the program that you're working with. Uh, this is the TEM user interface, and you can basically manipulate the, the X, Y, and Z coordinates in here. Uh, another program we use a lot uh, that uh, the Thermo Fisher has in uh, conjunction with their microscopes is the one called EPU. 
And in fact, this is the one I use most of the time when I when I just want to manipulate. Uh, it's very tiny now what it says here, but you can uh, easily manipulate things like uh, magnification, the, the dose of the, the beam that's coming in, as well as the uh, various camera setups. So what we do uh, ideally is we, we, we find um, a, um, a part of our, our sample that we want to look at. In our case, we look at uh, grid squares here and uh, we find identify one type of grid square that we think is good. It doesn't have too much contaminations on it. And then we, we progressively go uh, in, in magnification on this one. So first we, we go into the grid square magnification, which is generally about 500 to, to 1,000 or so times magnification, where we perform some sort of alignments. Usually we, we, we set the, the, the stage in the correct uh, C height. Uh, and then uh, we can go in even further into this called hole magnification, where we look at the, 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 the support fold that has holes in it, uh, I mentioned, usually around uh, 3,000 to, to 8,000 times magnification, depending on which type of uh, uh, grid you're using. And uh, just like uh, Aaron mentioned, there is a lot of uh, using this interface to, 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 to move around. So now you can see the crosshair is pointing in, at this uh, particular hole. I can easily just uh, right click here and tell it go to this hole and take a picture here instead. And this is how I manipulate um, going as shorter distances in, in this uh, sense. Finally, we go into the, the highest magnification where we actually want to, to, to take our images, uh, which is depending, of course, on your sample, are roughly 80,000 to maybe 150,000 times magnification. And you can see uh, you have your, your um, uh, yeah, your sample uh, here. In, in our this case, we we're looking at a single particle protein. Uh, there are of course times where you have to rely on the local colleagues, that is those of Umeå or or Stockholm, particularly in loading your sample. This is something that takes uh, twenty minutes for them to do. They do it in the morning, and then I can look at the the, the sample basically until the afternoon, and then I can load in, tell them to load in more samples, and then they will do this. They are also useful for fixing uh, major problems that you can have with the beam. Uh, like I said, uh, this joystick and these uh, knobs are limited in how you can interact with it, and therefore it's a good thing to, to, to have someone there that can help you in case it goes really off the grid, basically. That's why we load them. Okay. Um, so uh, <laughs> just uh, for the for the organization uh, remotely, it's not just about organizing the or controlling the the the, the machines. It's also about uh, keeping good booking and and record keeping. Uh, Rafa mentioned that we use CrossLab here in, in CCI. We use something called the EM Hub in 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 our place. I recommend you go there and, and give it a browse. There are some challenges with remote capabilities. We have seen some of them today. <laughs> Internet failure. Uh, usually, we are quite robust here in Sweden, uh, both in terms of uh, not getting a lot of power outages of the internet, but also in terms of speed. I never had so much problem with this. I didn't know that no machine did show this problem sometimes. Is that either one that was here? It's either yeah. one. Okay. The other things that uh, can happen, of course, is software errors. If your no machine, if your if your VNC viewer things goes off the line, uh, mm -hmm. I never had any problems with this. But perhaps something that could be good to use in the future is to to establish some sort of contract versus in those companies to help you with this. Troubleshooting errors is another thing. Uh, errors can be small or they can be big. Uh, in fact, if they're big, they tend to be easier to troubleshoot remotely because uh, you can't do it remotely. You have to get the technician to come and then uh, there is nothing you can do about it either remotely or local. Smaller errors, of course, you can uh, do misaligned beam, for instance, you can, uh, you can do yourself or you can contact the local co uh, colleague to, to help you fix them. And then we come to industry participation. Uh, Thermo Fishers has generally, historically, or FEI, been very, um, uh, how should I say, they don't want to, to, us to, to, to put stuff on their computers, uh, on the computers for the microscopes. But uh, maybe thanks to the COVID pandemic, this has uh, changed a little bit now, and we are allowed to, in fact, uh, use this uh, software on the machine so that we can remote control them. There's still no good control panel interface availability, uh, available commercially, but uh, hopefully that might come in the future. 
Uh, I'm, I'm just going to bridge to this just to mention again, uh, there are two, two things, two steps. Uh, the grid and the grid shipment, of course, you can't do um, remotely, that you have to do locally, but everything from the booking to, to the collection can be done more or less remotely nowadays. And with that, I say thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes.